uh, sort of want to start um, with a view of this is Roosevelt Hot Springs that uh, I think we're going to visit on the field trip on Wednesday, and this is just a plug for geothermal because there's a wind farm there. You can see it was completely still. Okay. Um, it, it, is, it is a slide, okay, but, uh, but you can see the ge geothermal steam rising straight up. Okay, this is a nice, cool fall morning, actually, from about a year ago. Uh, and it's just to emphasize that if you do geothermal right, uh, you have a sustainable system 24-7. You can't say that for the other major forms of uh, renewable energy. So uh, to sort of start with some major po points that I'll basically conclude with, uh, I actually think it's kind of ironic that with little water we have, uh, oh, and by the way, my emphasis will be at the Great Basin region, um, or the Basin Range of the Western U.S. I'll throw a few things in there from some other uh, parts of the world, but that's my emphasis. And, and, and I think it's ironic with that what little water we do have in this region is, is generally hot, uh, but we all know it's difficult to find sufficient fluid flow to sustain um, a, a good geothermal system. Uh, and in this region with the high heat flow uh, that Rick Ellis uh, talked about yesterday and Dave Blackwell has been working on for years, really permeability is far more important than temperature. We, we really have temperature just about wherever you look. Uh, and and another major point is most of our geothermal resources are warm. Okay? The, the easy systems have been found. Jed Clampett already found all of them, uh, and, and, and so we now need to use our geologic and geophysical smarts to go after the majority of the resources which are hidden or blind uh, uh, beneath the surface. And we've got to do our geologic, and I really should say geophysical, homework before you drill. And it's amazing how many um, areas I've seen where that hasn't been done. Uh, and fundamentally, we need better characterization of the known sites uh, uh, to really uh, uh, facilitate future uh, development. So, major points. Uh, this is sort of what I want to cover. Uh, a brief uh, sort of sidetrack into the tectonic, broad tectonic controls on this region. Uh, and then, look, you know, sort of pose a couple questions. Are strain rates in this region related to geothermal activity and actually the power potential of, of, uh, power, of uh, uh, generating or individual power plants, the, basically the capacity, uh, and then characterize the favorable structural settings for geothermal activity in this region and, and talk very briefly about uh, a few detailed studies of uh, individual systems, get into some 3D modeling, and then talk about key issues. Essentially what we're trying to do here is con sort of combine, if you will, conventional field methods, conventional geologic methods with innovative methods, things like 3D modeling, slip and dilation tendency analysis, etc. So, uh, and I should emphasize, this has been a team primarily at, uh, at UNR, University of Nevada, uh, several faculty, postdoc Drew Seiler, who's done a great job in, in pushing us into the 3D modeling world, a couple of research scientists, um, almost a dozen graduate students and undergrads, a bunch of dedicated people have allowed us to get quite a bit of work done in the past few years. This is part of our team there, the guy with the big funny ears, uh, I think from Middle Earth is, uh, is Drew Seiler, our postdoc. Uh, and, and a lot of, this is very critical too, a lot of industry collaborators, uh, uh, because that's where we've got, been able to get a hold of a lot of data, subsurface data, that's allowed us to build these uh, 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 3D models. So it includes ORMAT, uh, US Geothermal, Magna Energy, when they were called that, and now US Navy, et cetera. And then DOE support. Uh, this is the, the, the big grant, but also uh, several smaller grants. So a brief sort of view of the tectonic setting of this part of the world. Uh, we've got about five centimeters per year of sort of distributed shear between <clears throat> the Pacific Plate and North America, about 80% of that is on the San Andreas Fault, about 4 centimeters per year. The other 20% is distributed in this orange area called the Walker Lane, which is a system of strike slip faults on the east side of the Sierra Nevada. And we think that's pretty critical because about 1 centimeter per year of dextral shear, and, 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 and that comes up here and ends about where the San Andreas Fault ends. San Andreas Fault ends in a, in a complex triple junction, but basically plate motions are different 
across that triple junction. You've got the one centimeter per year of dextral shear on the Walker Lane. You don't have the convenience of a triple junction or a plate boundary in the interior, interior of the continent. So you've got to do something with that dextral shear. And what we think happens that gets diffused or transferred into extension in the uh, northwestern part of the Great Basin. And that's the most active part of the basin range today. If we go back 10 or 15 million years ago, there were these other very active regions. But this is the most active part of the basin range today. You can look at the uh, sort of geodetic strain rates here. The longer arrows indicate the, the greater uh, strain rate. Uh, and this is what we think is happening sort of in this region. It's sort of a broad pull apart zone as the dextral shear one centimeter per year ends and gets then distributed into extension uh, in the northwest part of the Great Basin. So uh, certainly uh, some extension, a couple millimeters per year along the eastern side of the Great Basin, Wasatch Front, where we are here. Um, but uh, strain rates are somewhat higher uh, today anyways in the northwest part of the Great Basin. Another key part of this tectonic setting is, is thinking about magnetism. So basically the San Andreas has grown northward through time as more and more Pacific plate came into contact with North America. Uh, and as that's happened, the, and, and the uh, subduction zone has retreated to the north, then the Cascade Arc has also retreated to the north. And what I'm getting at here is most of this region, not all, there's little uh, anomalies here and there of volcanism, magnetism, but most of this region today is amagmatic. So most of the geothermal systems in this region aren't in any way directly related to magnetism, at least not in the middle to upper crust. So that's not a good heat source for, for the geothermal activity in this region compared to other places in the world like the top of volcanic zone or Iceland, etc. So basically we've got high heat flow due to high rates of extension. So then keeping that in mind with respect to where the high strain rates are, and I'll show a strain rate map in a second, but this just shows the distribution of geothermal systems. Okay, so the warmer colors indicate uh, sort of a denser clustering of geothermal systems, geothermal activity, and these are the known systems, mind you. Okay, there's many, many more blind systems that we don't know about. Now, in these known systems, there are some blind systems okay, in that sort of database that we do know about. Okay, but basically, there's probably uh, three quarters as many systems. This might only represent one quarter to one third of the actual geothermal resources. You're but hot springs. What's that? Yeah, hot springs, that type of thing, uh, or hot wells, okay? Or in, in the cases like, let's say, some systems like Desert Peak where they've actually discovered a blind system. So this throws all that together, okay? So this is the distribution of all its 450-odd known systems, and you can see there's a cluster along the Wasatch Front here, and then there's another cluster in this northwest part of the Great Basin. Then if we, this, this is all the systems, but if we then just look at the high temperature systems and where we make that break uh, is at 150 C, then you can see the high temperature systems really cluster up in this part of the Northwest Great Basin where strain rates are a bit higher than along the Wasatch Front, although there are a few uh, uh, to the south of us along the front, but there is a magmatic component associated with those. So then this is looking at strain rates and then tying that into the actual capacity of the power plants. So all of these dots here represent geothermal systems. The red dots, the high temperature systems, the orange dots, sort of moderate temperature systems. These are all the systems uh, where temperatures are known to be above about 100 C. And then you can, the stars represent power plants, all those purple stars. And then this is all overlaid on a strain map that Corne Kramer and his colleagues uh, created. Uh, and, and basically the warmer colors indicate higher strains. So you can see the San Andreas really lights up. Okay? You can see though most of the San Andreas, there's no geothermal activity. Okay? Um, probably because it's dextral shear, most of the San Andreas is transpressional. Uh, but then you look at the clustering of geothermal activity in this region, you can see that the strain rates are somewhat higher there. That's that area where dextral shear gets diffused in the extension. And then you can see this other cluster of somewhat higher strain rates along the eastern side of the Great Basin along the Wasatch Front. You can sort of see another clustering of geothermal activity there. So if we just then looked at power plant capacities, and of course this is a limited database, it's only from about 25 or so uh, power plants, 
This is what comes out, which I think is really interesting. You can see there's many more power plants in the basin and range overall, but they never they top out at tens of megawatts, 60 megawatts, for example, uh, in, in Dixie Valley. And they never get to 100 megawatts. But if we get into systems within the Walker Lane, oh, and I should mention there's just in any one location in the basin range, strain rates are not higher than a millimeter or two per year. Then we get into the Walker Lane, where we've got about a centimeter of dextral shear, okay, and in areas where you have pull charts, stepovers, and extension within the Walker Lane, you can generate uh, geothermal activity. This would be COSA right there, and that's Steamboat, uh, on the order of a couple hundred megawatts, okay. And then we get into you know, the San Andreas systems, and realize San, most of San Andreas is transgressional, and I should really, let's say, plate boundary systems along that San Andreas fault system that where you have pull parts, okay, like in the Imperial Valley salt and trough, or at the geysers, and of course there's a magmatic component involved in both of those areas. But there we get into the, the many hundreds of megawatt systems, or at least we have that capacity. And so we got four centimeters per year of dextral shear along that San Andreas fault system. So there seems to be a tie with strain rate and, and, and power generating potential. And of course, the greater the strain rates and extension, the more likely you have, you're going to bring up magma from depth too. Okay? So you get involved in a magmatic component, both in the Walker Lane and in the, the large systems there and in the San Andreas there. And most of these in the basin range, not all, but most of these are amagmatic. So there's a general correlation between tectonic strain rate and power generating potential, at least in I think in this part of the world. So then this is just sort of a snapshot of geothermal production. All the uh, purple stars represent power plant. There's about 500 megawatts of capacity, nameplate capacity in all these power plants. This is just the Great Basin region, excluding now the systems along the main plate boundary, full of parts in the San Andreas, et cetera. But this is what's actually being produced. Okay? So there's a bit of an issue I mean, there's a reason why we're not, uh, most of those power plants not hitting, if, if you will, the capacity, okay? So, and that's a little troubling if we really want to move geothermal forward and have it become a major part of our energy budget. This is the tricky part that we probably all know about. You know, we obviously need, we need production wells and we need injection wells. And, and finding that balance between injection and production. If you inject too close, you cool your system down. If you inject too far away, you don't recharge the system. And so you've really got to understand the plumbing systems at depth in order to have a long-term sustainable system. And it's that lack of understanding probably that is leading to the problem of most of those power plants not sort of being able to produce at their nameplate capacity. So, then to sort of summarize, if you will, in one slide, if possible, the exploration challenges. Uh, th this is a couple of uh, old figures from a paper by uh, Maria Richards and Dave Blackwell that I, I, I really like because it really, I think, demonstrates the problem that we have with a typical basin arranged geothermal system in that the, the most common systems probably don't have a spring issuing directly above the fault that, that has the geothermal upwelling along it. So in other words, this is just a cross section, and if you've got geothermal fluids coming up along a particular fault, it's relatively rare that they, come, that, that they issue out directly on that fault. When they do, you've got maybe an easy system, you step back from the fault, go into the fault, and voila. But more often than not, probably those geothermal fluids come up to near the surface and leak out along some permeable layers within the basin, and the actual hot springs may be some many kilometers away from the actual upwelling. So you drill over here, and all of a sudden you've got overturn. Okay? Uh, temperatures go down with depth in your well. And, and that might be okay if you take all that fluid and run it along one outflow zone, but typically you've got several, several permeable layers in here, each one of them maybe it doesn't have high enough flow rates to sustain a system. And then this is probably the most common case, okay, where the fluids come up, up along a fault, they leak out along permeable layers within that basin, and they never see the light of day. They never issue out on the surface. 
they're a completely blind or hidden system. Okay? And so it gets real tricky. And for example, at Blue Mountain, you can have a production well you know, anywhere, any of these basin range systems. You might have a nice production well, a hot wet well, if you will, with per good permeability in, in one location. And just maybe a hundred, couple hundred meters away, you have a hot dry well. And again, most of those wells are hot, but its permeability is the key. And so the, then the key becomes finding those sweet spots along the fault zones. Where do those upwellings occur? And that then can guide where you're actually going to drill and reduce your, the risk of drilling unsuccessful wells. And so that's our approach, basically. You know, I realize the current te technology can't identify the best geothermal sites with a high degree of certainty without the drilling. So what we're trying to do is, is sort of better characterize those favorable settings and develop better conceptual models uh, for where these upflows, upflow zones occur uh, and then avoid the, these less productive outflow zones, if you will. And you know, this is interesting. We're really trying to capture with the geothermal system a hydrothermal system in action, if you will. I think this is more difficult than finding gold, okay? Because basically there's a lot of gold deposits. It's it's a fossil hydrothermal system out there, okay? And as long as it deposited gold, you're fine. You, you don't have to have it being, it doesn't have to be depositing gold right now. Okay. Here we need a hydrothermal system in action. Where are those fluids? going, moving through the rock right now um, at this time. And then of course, that's not necessarily easy. So, but I think it's doable, and our approach has been then to characterize the structural settings. This is a nice map, okay, there's a lot of effort put into this, shouldn't be minimized. A lot of geothermometry, geochemical studies, et cetera, went into you know, determining whether each of these systems is high or lower temperature and so on. But this just tells you where the systems are. And so what we're trying to get at is cataloging these systems in some way to, to develop an idea of what the geothermal signature is. At least, and this is from one perspective, and this is from the structural geology perspective, what are those favorable structural settings? There's other perspectives, geophysical signatures, et cetera, and, and not dealing with that. So realize it has, this has to be done on a number of fronts. So anyways, what we're doing is developing sort of a catalog of favorable structural settings and models we're trying to select representative sites for detailed study, detailed analysis. I say trying, because the detailed analysis were sometimes guided more by the availability of subsurface data. Uh, and, and then basically do 3D modeling of select systems and then get into uh, slip dilation tendency analysis. Basically, again, as I said earlier, trying to combine the conventional uh, sort of field techniques with innovative quantitative techniques to, to find those fluid uh, pathways and hopefully this will have an impact on um, exploration strategies and reducing the risks of uh, drilling an un unsuccessful well. So this is what we have found uh, in, in terms of sort of the favorable settings, the structural controls, the favorable structural settings. And initially this was surprising, but it really makes a lot of sense. Most of the fields are not on the big normal faults out there. They're not on the mid segments of those major faults. Instead, most of the geothermals are on less conspicuous normal faults, and these are the common occurrences. Ignore the BA and all that, because I've rearranged these for, for a reason. Uh, and these are the most common occurrences, fault tips, okay, basically the ends of major normal faults, where faults horsetail break into multiple splays, uh, as illustrated here. Steps or relay ramps in normal fault zones, where major normal fault zone steps over and then the, those two, two major strands of the fault are commonly connected by lots of little faults. And that's actually the winner. That's the most common uh, type of structural setting, at least in the Great Basin region. Uh, and then intersecting faults. And between any two intersecting faults, you tend to have dilational quadrants, if you will. Uh, and then accommodation zones. And accommodation zones are belts of kind of overlapping, oppositely dipping normal faults. These are the four major types. We do have pull aparts and strike slip faults. I'm not going to talk much about those because they're mainly in the Walker along strike slip faults, like with Walker Lane and Standard Grants. But if we just look at the extensional part of this region, these are the four primary um, uh, uh, structural settings. And there's sort of a hierarchy here, too, if you think about it. Um, the simplest setting is that fault termination. Okay? And then a step over, in a way, is two fault terminations. 
and then lots of little faults connecting those two major strands. Uh, and a fault intersection is sort of two, uh, if you will, fault terminations. And in any fault intersection, if you've mapped a lot of faults and you've got two big faults coming together, it's always your most disappointing field day because you never actually see the two, hardly ever see the two faults actually intersect because they break into lots of little faults when they're coming together. Okay, so, so fault intersections are critical. Uh, but then this is the most com complicated system here, the accommodation zone, where you've got a combination of fault terminations okay, and fault intersections. You've got the oppositely dipping neural faults, they're intersecting in a variety of ways, and you have various faults of one set or the other terminating in the same area. Okay? Basically, all of these systems or all these settings generate sort of subvertical conduits of more highly fractured rocks that therefore are more permeable. And this gets at how we think of a geothermal reservoir in a region like this. I think of it, I don't think of it in a stratiform way. I think of it in terms of these conduits of more highly fractured rock. And they very rarely are sub horizontal. They're more, more often than not sub vertical. Okay. So, uh, and just to say there are similar findings in other exceptional settings, the Taupo uh, zone of uh, New Zealand, work by Roland and Simmons, uh, Western Turkey, where I've done some work. And, and this is an interesting early study by Kuritz and Carson. I sort of did a worldwide analysis of geothermal systems and came up with very, very uh, similar findings. So this is then, we remember that map of the basin range with all the geothermal systems. Okay, in, you know, important contribution showing uh, low versus high temperature and so on. Okay, we turn that into this, then where all these systems now are cataloged according to their structural settings. And this is then how things sort themselves out with about a third of the systems are in those fault stepovers, relay ramps, uh, about a quarter of the system, systems on fault terminations, about another quarter of the systems on fault intersections and the accommodation zones about nine or 10% of the systems. Uh, and then I should also mention that quaternary faults, young faulting, are involved in almost all of these systems okay, in, in this region anyways. Uh, and I should also mention that um, while well, all of these settings are sort of where you have critically stressed fluid pathways, they're more likely to remain open. Okay, the big normal faults, faults with a lot of offset, two things going against them. Number one, the, the do the large amount of offset polarizing the rock, you're probably, probably creating a lot of clay gouge, okay? making good, good large portions of those faults impermeable. The second aspect of the big faults is that you relieve stress periodically with big earthquakes. It's these zones at the ends of faults where faults overlap or intersect where you, have, you don't relieve that stress and you have lots of little faults okay, that happen, or excuse me, little earthquakes that happen all the time. Okay? Um, so that's the key, and I should also mention that many of the more productive systems like Steamboat, uh, Brady's, etc., are, are a combination of settings. Okay? They you know, have more than one thing going for them, like a fault termination and a fault intersection, etc. So, and then just very quickly, I uh, don't have time to go into this in detail, but you see this in all other kinds of extensional settings. This is Iceland, Hingle, and basically this uh, power plant there is along a nice little step over. That's actually part of a relay ramp in the normal fault system along the mid-ocean ridge. Um, New Zealand, similar findings. Um, uh, Stuart Simmons has done a lot of work on this, as has uh, Julie Rowland. Western Turkey, similar findings. These are two of the highest temperature systems in, in Western Turkey, Germanjek and Kizildera. And, and basically, they're at the ends of the Menderis Graben, where the normal faults break into multiple splays. Just a schematic of that. And actually, some of the wells at Germanjek, there's a 47 megawatt power plant there now. I understand that they're building another one that's comparable. And, and some of the wells in that system penetrate some upwards of 25 fault splays okay, near the end of that big normal fault. So uh, exploration applications then. Uh, how can we use this to go after new systems? Well, we can just sort of, for example, fault terminations, where do major range front faults in? We might, this might be a prospective area. Um, uh, basically, big stepovers in either small faults or big faults, something like that. So this might be a prospective area. Uh, this would be uh, interbasinal high, if you will, maybe in an accommodation zone where one range fault 
uh, here comes uh, to the north, terminates, and another big rainfall over here comes toward the south and terminates. Interbasinal high, something like that. And then areas like this, sort of in the sort of inconspicuous areas where you have lots of you don't have big mountain ranges, but lots of little fall of ridges and so on. And this is indicative of basically normal fault systems sort of playing with one another and not any particular fault sort of uh, gaining control and having huge amounts of slips. So you have lots of sort of intersecting, overlapping faults, maybe a very prospective area. And actually, each one of these areas I've shown have um, no uh, geothermal uh, resources in them. And then just to get at, there's vast resources out there. This is just a snapshot of the northern hot spring mountains, about 80 kilometers northeast of Reno. And there's three systems in here, okay? Brady's, Desert Peak, and Desert Queen. Two of the three, and they're all good, high temperature, viable systems. Two of the three are blind, completely blind, Desert Queen and Desert Peak. Brady's is the only one that has surface expressions. And, and in fact, the healthy, healthiest system here is the blind system Desert Peak that's been going for 30 years with very little drawdown and very little temperature drop. Uh, so I think, I actually think that every major fault zone in this part of the world probably has a geothermal system on it. There, these, so see, note the scale there, five kilometers. Each major normal fault zone has got a geothermal system on it. And each of them appears to be independent of each other geochemically. So back of the envelope calculations, you get 30,000 megawatts out of this region, if that's true to all the fault zones. Okay. The other way to look at this too, I've, I've heard, well, we can never compete with oil and gas and blah, blah, blah. To a certain extent, that's true. But, but this is the North Sea. Okay. Note the scale there. That's the oil and gas fields. They're big. This is West Africa, somewhat dated. There's been a lot of work. This is like from the 1999, 2000. You can see the size of those oil and gas fields. Okay. We need to think about geothermal in that way. There's Field, the fields are that large. Okay, we're not going to get suck all that hot water and produce all that energy out of a couple wells in one little area. So I think of this as sort of being a region that's a broad geothermal field, 20 megawatts here, 20 megawatts here, 20 megawatts there. Maybe the next normal fault over here has got another 20 megawatts. So all of a sudden we've got a small region, a subregion producing maybe 100 or a couple hundred megawatts. One way to think about it, anyways. Okay, I'm probably be running out of time. Real quickly, representative sites. I'll just uh, go over a couple here. Um, and this is our exploration workflow. So we get it. We've got to do the detailed studies on individual sites. And so this, I won't go through all that. That's just sort of putting it all in a chart. We start with detailed mapping, um, analyzing fault zones, incorporate whatever geophysical data we can get our hands on. We're not geophysicists ourselves, but we work with good geophysicists. Some of my best friends are geophysicists. Um, and then we uh, incorporate well data. And it's very important, once you get an understanding of that stratigraphy, to go back in and do your own logging. Okay, look at those cuttings and for yourself with the knowledge of that local stratigraphy. Mud loggers, there's no way. I mean, mud logger, you're not going to be out there mapping and not really understand the stratigraphy. They do the best they can. Okay, but you've got to go back in and redo it. Then develop detailed cross-sections from there, build 3D models, incorporate, if you've got slip data from faults in the area, incorporate that to calculate stress, stresses your stress field, or better yet, if you've got borehole breakout data, uh, use that to calculate your stress field. Then do slip dilation tendency analysis in three dimensions, okay, to understand where fluids are more likely to go develop your 3D model, decide where to drill, and voila, you've got a new geothermal system. I guarantee, well, no, I guarantee you. <laughs> so real quickly, some success stories. Uh, this is uh, uh, Desert uh, Peak. Uh, this, these are the four original production wells. Uh, one of the first systems I worked on, a nice step over in a two, <coughs> between two uh, major strands on a normal fault. They, uh, or man was drilling, we actually, this was the first area, at least I studied, um, realized it was a step over about 10 years ago, but it was like an example, it was like one of one. I told Ormat, I think, you know, if you want to expand the system, get back in the step over, but they said, Jim, this is only like one case, okay, just sort of getting going on this. Uh, and then as data accumulated within a few years, realizing that these step overs were a big deal, and then um, 
couple years later, after having several hot dry wells here, more man drilled then two additional wells back in that step over, if you will, and was able to almost uh, double the uh, capacity of the system. Um, and this is their EGS well here, uh, hot dry well, but close enough okay, to the main production zone that they were able to sort of crack back into it. And then a successful EGS story, where I think it went in the game about two megawatts, I think, remember, Gene? One and a half? Yeah. Uh, and then this is just an example. Actually, let me go back. Note the scale here of this step over. Where's, uh, that's a kilometer, so a fairly small step over. This is Tuscarora. It's a big step over. Okay, there's five kilometers between two big range front faults. You can't go drilling all across that step over. So this is a very nice study that a uh, master student of mine, Greg Deering, did and did very detailed logging and, uh, and uh, the existing core and cuttings. So what part, of the, and we knew what part of the system where the hot springs were, and, and Ormat developed the system recently into an 18 megawatt power plant. But what's special about that little location? You can see it's got a higher density of faults and so on within it, uh, and also a little bit of an accommodation zone within that broad step over where there's some intersecting opposite big dipping faults. What I'm getting at is you can't, find you know, every step over, there's different scales of these things. You can't drill all over these step overs. You'd be broke. So what, what can you use to guide you into the most perspective part of something like this? And then basically the density fault, or the faulting maybe is most complex. Um, and that's that. And this is Brady's, uh, sort of another sort of step over, more complicated though. And this is Kerr's at all scales. That's about a kilometer there. And this is the scale of notebook. All those little fissures are stepping to the left as well. Um, this we developed into a 3D model. And then that's the, 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 the hot part, the, actually the productive part of the system, I should say. Those red, four red stars are the production wells. And then we did something a little bit different. We took a 3D model, and then we mapped out fault density within that 3D model. This, this, this is our reservoir, OK? In this setting, it's not stratiform. Okay, these are pipes of a basically greater fault density. That's where the four production wells are coming down in, hitting that cluster, if you will, of intersecting faults. That's a hot dry well over here. That's your EGS well. Okay, where they missed it. Okay, but they didn't have a 3D model to go on when they drilled that well several years ago. So what I'm getting at is different way of thinking about these reservoirs. And it's sort of like pressure pipes, if you will. Uh, and then using slip dilation tendency analysis, I'll breeze through this, I'm running out of time. 3D modeling then, to take that slip dilation tendency analysis, look at what portions of faults have the greatest tendency to slip or dilate in a particular area. Okay, combine that with looking at the sort of density of fault intersections in 3D to guide where you might drill in the future. Uh, and also understand where your existing reservoirs are. We did the detailed stratigraphy on, so on, on this, and we now realize that, that at Brady's they're producing from two sort of geologic units, stratigraphic units in that area, which then are faulted. So this combination of the fault zone itself, but then which sort of stratigraphic units sort of are more competent, maybe break up into more fractures, et cetera, um, in terms of the actual production. Conclusions, key issues. How, and one thing I haven't addressed that I think you know, would be important to think about, how are these fault-controlled hydrothermal systems related to sedimentary hosted systems in active tectonic regions? And, and can we key into certain parts of the basins, um, you know, and, and finding these systems that Rick talks about and others and, and, and basically sort of combine these techniques? Uh, of course, better characterization of existing systems is needed. Uh, we've got to integrate geologic geophysical data, generate those 3D models to really understand fluid flow pathways, reservoir types. There's different reservoir types. Think about this with fault controlled systems. EGS is not the short term answer. Nine gigawatts worldwide, a few megawatts on EGS uh, to date. And, and, and then this is something I've been thinking about. Can industry and our community do a better job of educating the public? Um, on site visitor centers, activities, one approach. You know, whenever I like get in the shuttle, like when I drove up here on a geothermal conference. Oh, that's me. You know, is that relevant to me? Okay. Um, I always get those questions from the lay public. You know, we 
They don't really think geothermal, but they know about wind and solar. And then I think we need some analog studies of epithermal mineral deposits that have been eroded and exposed to better understand the complex plumbing of these uh, geothermal systems. So, thanks. Thank you. Oh, and that's, that's still water, okay? Oops. Um, you can see uh, you don't generate much power from the moonshine at night, but that power plant is still going. We're going to hold questions. I know you have some, I have some. <laughs>